Good afternoon and thank you for joining us for our 11th faculty session entitled BIMFRA Analysis Update, 12 months on. My name is Sarah Graham, I'm the UK Division Head for IES and based here in the headquarters in Glasgow. Okay, so I'd just like to set some context around this afternoon's session um, by looking at what is happening with BIM globally giving some examples, some of the main policy, business and technology drivers for this paradigm shift that we see within our construction industry. In the UK, we have a clear mandate, level two BIM on all centrally, fu fu centrally funded public projects from April 2016, with the aim of measuring carbon cost and value across the asset life cycle. Scotland planning to follow suit with a drive to implement Level 2 BIM on public projects from 2017 and following the mandate as set out in, in the UK. David Philp, who is one of the main protagonists in the Cabinet Office BIM Task Group and is heading up the drive in Scotland, states that BIM is a key part of the future of the construction industry. Improving data management and collaboration delivers greater efficiencies through design, construction and operation. <clears throat> We also see where there is no mandate, public sector organisations adopting BIM within their procurement. So examples of that we see in Ireland, echoed in Scandinavia by the Swedish Health Service and Finnish and Norwegian state property agencies promoting the use of BIM. The EU Commission has now funded a Europe-wide BIM alignment project and this week announced that a handbook will be produced um, covering the guiding principles of BIM for member states who want to instate BIM at a procurement level. It's difficult to get an accurate picture <clears throat> of what is happening around the world currently uh, with regards to BIM uptake. I've used an image here which is produced by Tecla in 2013 giving an overview of usage and then a bar chart from a recent McGraw-Hill Smart Market report looking at the business value of BIM from a contractor's perspective. So neither of these are particularly inclusive, but I think they do give a good indication of areas which are perhaps more advanced in their uptake of BIM. Um, and then the trends that we see in the, in the bar chart between 2013 and 2015 with regards to BIM implementation levels. What I do know is that University of Teesside are undertaking a, a global review which is due for publication mid-2016 and this should give us a fairly good insight into what is happening around the world. So as well as the policy drivers, we see some business drivers which perhaps motivate the private sector and other regions where there's no mandate. Um, the perceived business, this report produced by Dodge Analytics offers an insight into what these be business benefits are. So fairly high up in the agenda would be visualisation, a better way to understand the proposed design, integration of analysis to deliver better design, coordination reducing errors and thus saving money, and improvement to cost and schedule prediction and planning. Knowledgeable clients in the private sector are pursuing BIM on projects to realise some of these benefits. And some localised examples of this would be Crossrail, um, HS2, the High Speed Rail uh, Infrastructure Project, King's Cross Redevelopment and Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Glasgow. And I'm sure for those of you who are not in the UK, there will be some localised examples that you can cite also. But these benefits are very much focused on design and construction and result largely from the 3D modelling co coordinated design class detection. But what about operation and information? Those are the bits that we are most interested in and where the carbon cost and value can best be addressed through the building life cycle. <clears throat> So performance is perhaps a bit less obvious when we're looking at drivers and success stories that we read about. However, it's a trend that we see emerging, very much so. Last year, we heard a lot and we talked a lot about the performance gap, and we see BIM as being a vehicle to close the gap on the basis of continuity of information through design, construction and operation that, in theory, a BIM approach facilitates. This presents us with a great opportunity 
Um, one example of a policy document that links BIM with energy efficiency would be Health Technical Memorandum 0702. We also have in place the Soft Landings Framework, which forms part of the BIM mandate and is aimed at setting performance metrics at the outset of a project and measuring those once the building is operational. Metrics are typically client defined. What information do I need to run this building? What's important to me? Is it cost carbon? Is it comfort linked to productivity? Is it availability of spaces? Overheating perhaps? There's not much in the way of standards around this yet. We have some examples uh, such as lead measurement and verification, again focused on energy, carbon. Neighbours in Australia looking more at post-occupancy evaluation. In the UK we have BRIAM in use and throughout Europe. Um, recently the UK GBC launched their building performance task group to gather industry perspective, not just from the UK but all over the world on performance. What does it mean to the different stakeholders? How is it procured or how could it best be procured? Why is it important? Again, what are the business drivers? And in September last year, we saw the publication of the Wellness Standard, which sets out 100 performance metrics, strategies and policies that could be implemented by owners, designers, contractors, operators and occupiers to determine, measure and improve on health and well-being of building users. It's suggested that the standard complements environmental sustainability and is designed to work in harmony with LEED amongst other voluntary environmental rating systems. So we see varia great variability in the uptake of BIM globally. We see some variability in the understanding of what it means and in people's early experiences. However, it is my view the technology within the construction industry and within our lives generally is marching ahead regardless. The challenges that we now face in trying to get design technologies to talk to one another will disappear as the demand for better, smarter, safer construction techniques and smart buildings grows. <clears throat> um, the UK BIM task group published in February last year, Digital Built Britain, which outlines a fairly high level strategy for level three BIM, so moving forward from level two, which we're targeting this year, next year. And Digital Built Britain looks forward to a time within the next decade when building information modeling will encompass the internet of things, advanced data analytics and the digital economy with the aim of planning new buildings and infrastructure more effectively, building at lower cost and operating and maintaining more efficiently and thus enabling citizens to make better use of the built environment. So we already see we already see a move towards more modular building techniques and the use of augmented reality to convey information to tradespeople on site. Okay, perhaps not commonplace, but starting to, to come online. And what we do see as well is our customers changing their own business processes to streamline information creation and management moving towards a digital engineering and construction age. And these companies rely on current technology, but they will also be best placed to exploit new technology as it comes online. So within IES, we invest over a quarter of our turnover every year in R&D. Now, most folks who know us, know us for the new design retrofit element of what we do, i.e. the suite of design tools that some of you will already be using. But that's only part of what we're about. Our aim is very much to move people around the vir this virtuous circle that we see. And as the drivers that I've mentioned previously come, come into play more and more, then more people will be, a, will be in a position to take advantage of this virtuous circle. So from your building model, we can start to link in real data from the building and operation to compare predicted with actual performance. And that's all aspects of performance. We can scale that technology up then from individual buildings to the district or city level and master pl planning provides the link between the large scale, larger scale models and the new design element. And our goal is to optimise the design and operational performance of any building district city anywhere in the world. The virtual environment as we know it offers a single platform for performance or analysis or compliance through design commissioning and operation. 
maintaining the continuity of information by creating, capturing, analysing and exchanging information at each stage of the asset life cycle. <clears throat> so, at the early stages of design, before even a model is available, we can start to look at climate and maybe availability of natural resources. What are we designing for or what are we designing against? Uh, we can carry out optioneering to optimise the layout of the building within the local environment and subject to its, its actual usage. We can evaluate compliance with building codes, building standards, building regulations, with voluntary schemes including LEED, BRIAM, Green Star, Estadama, uh, at the pre-assessment, intermediate and as built phases of the project. We can carry out detailed systems design, we can look at costing in terms of capital and life cycle. Then at the commissioning stage, um, prior to handover, the data that's been created and collated, collected can be used to ensure that the starting point of the building is correct. Then once in operation, we can provide an ongoing feedback loop for any aspect of performance. Now, Doug and John will dig into the details of some aspects of how this process should work. And Doug will also cover some of the, the enhancements that our customers can expect to see in the next 12 months. <clears throat> Uh, the one thing that I'm going to mention is the release of a new navigator. Um, we're putting together a, a new interoperability navigator, which will extend the capability that currently exists within the software, pulling all aspects of interoperability into one place and placing more transparency around the process. Because I've, as I've tried to um, highlight here, the technology is only one aspect of a BIM-enabled approach. The process absolutely needs to to be in place as well to be able to let practitioners take advantage of it. So the new navigator will pull all of the, the capability into one place, uh, we will include some enhanced reportage within the nav and guidance notes, checking functionality, all of that sort of thing. So it should be a lot clearer about how it's supposed to work. <clears throat> 